Hey everybody, it's Timothy here with Mana Rocks and doing something a little different today instead of a draft video, which will probably be up sometime this week. We are going to look forward to the corset coming out in two weeks and look at the top 10, in my opinion, the top 10 build around cards in the set. This range from uncommons all the way up to mythic rares. And what I mean by a build around is a card that will affect the way you draft and the type of deck you want. Um, the thing for me, the big hallmark of a good build around or an interesting build around is something that affects the way you draft so it would make you take cards that you normally wouldn't take or would take very low in a pack or very late in a pack much higher to sculpt a sort of strategy or sort of archetype in the set and there are a lot of archetypes being represented in this core set so we're going to talk about 10 of those cards today and i would love to hear from you all as to whether you think they're good build arounds or if I missed any that you might be interested in. So let's go ahead and jump right on in with our first one. This is actually going to be one of the uncommons on our list. This is Druid of Horns. So Druid of Horns is three and a green for a 2-3 human druid creature. It is uncommon, as I said, and it says whenever you cast an aura spell that targets Druid of Horns, create a 3-3 green beast creature token. So you... Cassinara, it targets this, you get a 3-3 out of the deal. Basically, every single aura you cast comes attached with a 3-3, and you get to suit up your Druid of Horns. So the idea is you want to Voltron and suit up Druid of Horns, make it gigantic with your auras, and you just get rewarded with 3-3s. And in case you don't know, 3-3s in a core set are usually pretty decently sized creatures. Core sets tend to be a little bit lower power. The creature size tends to be generally on the smaller side rather than the huge... Um, overwhelm inside, so you see a lot of use out of these 3 threes. Now, just giving a quick glance over the entire set, there are a total of 11 R's in the set. Most of them are centered in green and white, since green and white has a little bit of an enchantment theme. On screen, there's about 8 of them here, only 2 of which are rares, and out of the 11 total R's, one of them is black, 2 of them are negative pacifism style effects, and then you've got the ones that are on screen here, not really counting metamorphic alteration altogether since you won't often be blue when you draft this card, but imagine playing Druid of Horns into Knightly Valor. Suddenly you have a 4-5 Vigilance with your Druid of Horns. You get to create a 2-2 Vigilant Knight and you also create the 3-3 off of the Druid. Seems pretty ridiculous. And you can even cast some of the weaker auras like Knight's Pledge, Talons of Wildwood. These are cards that aren't going to be insanely good in most decks, but will be playable, I'm sure. And with Druid of Horns as the target for these auras, they become pretty insane. Oaken form, something that just gives plus three, plus three, when it also creates a 3-3 three, three beast token, is borderline broken. So I see Druid of Horns being the type of card you pick early and start prioritizing these auras. And notice that a lot of auras, cards like Tylons of Wildwood, Ether Tunnel, Knight's Pledge, these are the type of cards that are going to go late in a draft, so you can get rewarded quite a bit. One more thing to mention on the Druid that I basically already said is Green White's archetype is Auras. There are about three or four cards in the set that care about enchantments or Auras specifically, so keep in mind that when you're in Green White, you have some of these Hallmark cards. The Gold card, which I didn't mention here, is also Aura-based. It's an Enchantress-style card that draws you cards when you cast Aura, so be on the lookout for those two when you're drafting around your Druid of Horns. Next up, we've got one of the, uh, the enchantments, one of the rare enchantments in the set, and spoiler, number three is also going to be an enchantment, but let's look at the blue one first. So this is Patient Rebuilding. This is five mana total, three and double blue for a rare enchantment, as the next one will be as well. And it says, at the beginning of your upkeep, target opponent puts the top three cards of their library into their graveyard. Then you draw a card for each land card put into the graveyard this way. So we've got a mill rare, right? And a lot of times these don't really work out in limited. They're usually for constructed purposes or for older formats or casual people who tend to like mill for whatever sick twisted reason. But here we've got a mill card that I think is actually going to work out in limited. For one, it's almost always going to draw you a card off the trigger. If you're milling three cards at a time from your opponent... It's very, very likely that you're going to mill at least one land out of those three cards. Just statistically speaking, that's going to happen majority of the time, maybe 80, 90 percent of the time. So patient rebuilding equates to, you know, every turn draw an extra card. Sure, it's five mana to get down and draw an extra card might not be worth five mana, but it is the type of thing a control deck can take care of and definitely take advantage of. 
in addition to that, there's some support for the mill theme here. You've got a new card called Psychic Corrosion, which could have easily been in this spot. Two and a blue, uncommon enchantment that says whenever you draw a card, each opponent puts the top two cards of their library into their graveyard. So, uh, harkening back to Sphinx's Tutelage, obviously it doesn't have the activated ability that Tutelage has, but it's probably good enough as a win condition on its own in a control deck. Not only does Psychic Corrosion just mill your opponent two every turn, in addition to the card they draw, so essentially three cards gone from your opponent's library every turn cycle, but if you get to draw cards off Patient Rebuilding, that triggers the Corrosion, and you're milling the three from the Rebuilding, the two from Trigger and Corrosion off of the card you draw with the Rebuilding, and then you draw a card for a turn and mill two more. That's seven cards per turn cycle, plus an extra card that your opponent draws every turn is eight cards. And that's just between these two enchantments alone. So you're talking about possibly a three to four turn clock here, um, if not faster based on what your opponent's doing. So I see these two coupling together to make a pretty good control deck. And then it's worth mentioning Millstone is in this set too. Now Corrosion and Rebuilding are the type of cards that I expect to go around in a draft a little more often because there's not a ton of support. Millstone might get taken up a little early because there are graveyard synergies in this format that some decks might be interested in. Otherwise, you know, milling themselves essentially. But Millstone is another uncommon that fits perfectly with this rare. So even though this is basically it for milling, I think these cards are strong enough options that if you can wall up or build a pretty decent control deck with enough removal and enough stall tactics, you can use these as your win conditions. And if you happen to get all two, two or three of these, all of them combined together, they do put a pretty significant clock on your opponent. So against a slower deck, these are very potent win conditions. And I imagine patient rebuilding is going to be a lot better than some people are giving it credit for at the current time. The other enchantment I wanted to talk about, mono-covered enchantment, is Sarkin's Unseal. And this one actually seems pretty broken in the right kind of deck. So let's read it real quick. Sarkin's Unsealing is three and a red for a rare enchantment. So four mana enchantment. It says, whenever you cast a creature spell with power, four, five, or six, Sarkin's Unsealing deals four damage to any target. So basically all of your four power, five power, six power creatures that are coming down turn into flame tongue kabus. They get to snipe down your opponent's creatures, or if you've already dealt with other creatures, you get to start dealing four to your opponent's face, which to me is insane. Just look at some of the bare bones commons in the set. These are just commons. They're not exceptional cards, but they're just a couple examples of creatures that have power four. And we're not even talking about you know, high mana cost cards. These are three and four drops in the set that trigger Sarkin's Unsealing and turn into Flame Tongue Kabus. Just destroy target creature and opponent controls and add to your board seems pretty insane. Yeah, you got to get the Unsealing down first, which takes basically a turn, but these cards are serviceable on their own. It's not like if you don't draw the Unsealing, your cards are just dead. You've still got decently sized creatures on board. And Red Green does have a lot of support for this 4 power, 5 power theme that's going on. So yeah, you can see how Sarkin's Unsealing gets out of hand very quickly when every creature you cast starts destroying an opponent's creature. And then there's that second part, which is a little bit on the Pipe Dream side. Let's just go ahead and take a moment to look at all the creatures that trigger it. So again, the second part says, whenever you cast a creature spell with power 7 or greater, Sarkin's Unsealing deals 4 damage to each opponent and each creature in Planeswalker they control. So it wipes your opponent's board, also deals 4 to their face, and takes out any Planeswalkers they may luckily have. Now, unfortunately, there are only 5 creatures in this entire set that can trigger this win condition, <laughs> or rather this... Um, Second condition, maybe not a win condition, but it'll probably win you the game. Three of them are rares between Gigantosaur and Polaka Worm, as well as Chromium, which is pretty horribly off color for this sort of thing. And then you've got two uncommons in the set, Gaspark Twins and Inferno Helion. These are the only five cards in the set that can trigger that second ability. And I do want to pause and make sure people understand that the second ability and the first ability, the whole card in general, triggers off of the creature's power not its converted mana cost. So it doesn't matter if your card costs 7 mana to cast, it has to have power 7 or greater. And from that point, it doesn't matter if it gets countered or not, it's going to wipe that board if you cast it. It is a cast trigger, which makes this card super intriguing against people with control magic or cancel and cards like that. So, all else aside, if you don't get these specific cards, you still rely on the first part, but I think Sarkin's Unsealing is the type of card you'll be happy to first pick and start drafting around. Again, a very good build around 
changes the way you would draft your deck, where you start taking three mana four twos over possibly better cards because you have a synergistic build. You have this rare that takes advantage of it. So I'm hoping this card pans out as a powerful build around. It certainly seems strong to me. And ignoring the second condition altogether, I still think it's a very powerful card that we should be on the lookout for. With that being said, let's go and get into some of the tribal stuff here. The core set has a good amount of tribal, even though none of the tribes are supported to the point where you're going to have a deck completely made out of that tribe. The first example I want to give here is Liliana Untouched by Death. Very unique Planeswalker design in that it revolves almost entirely around the zombie tribe, which we've seen Liliana's deal with zombies before, but not entirely with zombies. So let's go and read the card. Liliana Untouched by Death is four mana, two and double black for a four loyalty Planeswalker. It is a mythic, obviously, as all Planeswalkers in the set are. And it says, first off, plus one, put the top three cards of your library into your graveyard. If at least one of them is a zombie, each opponent loses two life, and you gain two life. So this is her primary ability. I think this is the driving point of the card. The zombie phrase, the zombie add-on here is a nice little touch, but really that adding three cards to your graveyard every turn is really the crux of what I think makes this card tick. That being said, the minus two, the second ability, target creature gets minus X minus X until end of turn, where X is the number of zombies you control. Obviously, if you have two or three zombies on board, this is a pretty decent ability. It's a removal spell, and you can use it twice in a row, if nothing else, to just two for one your opponent. And then her quote-unquote ultimate, which is not a typical ultimate, her minus three says you may cast zombie cards from your graveyard this turn. That's pretty cool, right? In a longer game, that has a lot of advantage. But you could also sometimes in the late game just cast Liliana, minus three her, and then maybe get a cheap zombie or two out of your graveyard and get an advantage out of that. Basically a black draw spell, if you will. Now, like I said, there aren't highly supported tribes here out of the entire core set 200 something cards there are only nine zombie creatures in the entire set we've got a little bit of zombie support but it's not huge and a couple of them are rares too so if you're picking up your liliana you might not expect to pick up your rare zombies as well but you know some people get lucky like that so yeah nine zombies and then in addition to that there are three other cards in the set that can produce zombies or die and make zombies and things of that nature or reanimate creatures as zombies like I said, you're not going to have a deck with 23 zombies. It's just not going to work, or 15 zombies. You might have a deck that has somewhere around 5, 6, 7 zombies, and it will affect your draft order, but I think Liliana's real power is in the plus 1 ability to fill up your graveyard, because looking through the set, there's a lot to take advantage of the graveyard. You've got cards like Macabre Waltz, Rise from the Grave that really benefit from having more choices in your graveyard, and then your generic cards like Grave Digger that basically dig up past creatures or creatures that have died but if you can fill up your graveyard you get to essentially turn Liliana into a type of draw spell or a type of enabler and yeah if you get that two life drain off of hitting a zombie then great Liliana definitely pulls her weight or if you get that minus two ability and you get to kill some creatures that's fantastic too but I think if you draft Liliana and then you take cards that interact with the graveyard highly, you'll really see Liliana pull her weight as a build-around card rather than just a generic zombie planeswalker. Moving on from that, we've got another really uh, similar card in that it cares about the graveyard, and this is a very unassuming card, but hear me out on this one. So Reassembling Skeleton is a reprint. I think it's the only reprint in our on our list today. It's one in a black, for those who don't know, for a 1-1 uncommon skeleton warrior. And it has the activated ability of one in a black, return it from the graveyard to the battlefield tap. So this is the type of card that essentially blocks forever. It's the eternal chump blocker, but it has a ton of utility in the set. So much so that I think you can take Skeleton, the Reassembling Skeleton, and just start looking for things that interact with it. Let's just look at the rares that interact with Reassembling Skeleton. You have Open the Graves. This is a 5-mana enchantment that makes a 2-2 zombie whenever a creature dies. Great. Every time your skeleton dies, boom, you get a zombie token. You've got Demon of Catastrophes, which requires a sacrifice in order to be cast, and Reassembling Skeleton is the type of creature that you're always hoping you have on board for these sorts of effects. You have Mentor of the Meek, which, when coupled with a sacrifice engine, which we'll talk about in a minute, Mentor of the Meek and Reassembling Skeleton produces a card draw engine, three mana, essentially, to bring your skeleton back and draw a card off Mentor of Meek. And if you can sacrifice the skeleton, you can repeat that over and over again. 
You've got Dark Dweller Oracle, which is a new card that lets you sacrifice creatures to play the top card of your library, essentially, if you can afford to play it, which, similar to Mentor of the Meek, is another card draw engine, basically a card advantage engine, although it's red-black instead of black-white, which is probably more supported for this sort of uh, interaction. You've got the Mythic Rare Elder Dragon, Vivicus Asmati, the Dire, which can target Reassembling Skeleton and turn it into a random permanent on top of your library. And then you've also got Desecrated Tomb, which, spoiler alert, that's going to be on our list later on. Desecrated Tomb makes a 1-1 flyer every time Reassembling Skeleton comes back to the battlefield since it's leave in the graveyard. It triggers the Desecrated Tomb's abilities. And these are just rares. These aren't even all the commons and uncommons. You've got tons of cards that work with an effect like this. Anything that loots, anything that requires you to discard in a card for an advantage is perfect with the skeleton because the skeleton's going to come back from your graveyard anyway. It's almost like you didn't even discard that card if it turns into a creature that you can reanimate later on. Torment and Voice, Surge Mare, Macabwats, these are all cards that require you to discard something for some sort of advantage and having that skeleton to discard is perfect. And then you've got the sacrifice cards like Blood Divination, which lets you sack a creature to draw three cards, or the two engines, Ravenous Harpy and Brawl Bash Ogre. Sorry, I have to say that one really slow or I'm going to mispronounce it. These are the two creatures in the set that let you repeatedly sacrifice something over and over again. They're both uncommon, so you can see kind of the engine that you need to get together. There aren't, I believe, any common sacrifice engines like the Harpy or the Ogre, but these are the cards you're looking to assemble, no pun intended, with the Reassembling Skeleton so that you can make those rares work. So yeah, Reassembling Skeleton, normally not a fantastic card on its own, but look at all the interactions with it and tell me it doesn't look like a build-around to me, or at least the type of card you're super happy to have with some of the other build-arounds in this set. And enough talking about the undead, let's talk about one of the other tribes here, the knights. So, as far as I know, knights were supposed to be in the second Dominaria set before they split things up, um, or rather brought things together and made Dominaria a single set. And a lot of the knight tribal stuff that was intended for Dominaria was moved over to the core set, and we see some of that here, starting with Valiant Knight. Valiant Knight is 3 and a white for a 3-4 rare human knight, and it's a ward. It says your other knights get plus one, plus one. But more importantly, it has this activated ability. Three and double white. So five mana. Knights you control gain double strike until end of turn. One of the most powerful abilities in limited, double strike. Just lets you push past blockers, makes it impossible for your opponent to attack into you with non-evasive creatures. And if you couple this with other knights, it becomes crazy good. Given a whole team of creatures, Double Strike is insane. Now, here's where this enters build around territory. Obviously, it's a Knight Lord, but look how many Knights are in this set. This is it. These are the five Knights in the set besides the Valiant Knight. In addition to that, there are two other cards that produce Knights. So if you're including Valiant Knight and the two cards on the right here, that's a total of eight cards in the set that do anything or interact in any way with Knights. And three of them are rares. Now, the most important one here is Valiant Knight, right? If you pick this up early or you first pick it, you're going to start looking for these other cards highly. Again, I can't stress this enough. A good build around is the type of card that changes your draft pick order. It changes the order in which you'd pick cards. Knight of the Tusk, the six mana, three, seven Vigilance, doesn't look like the type of card you want in a lot of decks. But if you pick up Valiant Knight first, of course you're going to pick up Knight of the Tusk. It's the four, eight double striker some amount of the time. With Vigilance, it's impossible to beat something like that without removal spells all the time. So yeah, Valiant Knight seems great if you can pick up some of the Knight stuff. And the thing that really makes it a great build around is that it's good on its own. Even if you don't have a lot of other Knights to support it, or maybe you only have one or two, it's still a card that can threaten to attack for six, or activate its ability on blocks and just take out an attacker. It's a very difficult card to interact with in combat if there's five mana available to the controller. And if you have other knights on board, it should be able to take up a game very, very quickly. Things like Knightly Valor and Sigiled Sword of Valoron just get really out of hand very quickly. And the fact that you can give those cards double strike with the knight just seems insane. Not to mention, it just it's a lord, right? Even if you don't activate the ability, you're still giving these other creatures plus one, plus one. Which, at the very least, makes this bomb worthy if you can draft around it. Last tribal card I want to talk about here is kind of a poster child for all of the dragon synergy in the set. Now, we've got to say, first off, the card is Dragon's Horde. 
Dragon's Horde. Let's read it first before we talk about uh, dragons in M19. So Dragon's Horde is three mana for a rare artifact, and it has three effects. It says when a dragon enters the battlefield under your control, put a gold counter on Dragon's Horde. You can tap it and remove a gold counter to draw a card, or you can just tap it for mana of any color. So you've got a mana rock, essentially, a three mana mana rock that fixes your colors. That already to me, is a good card in sets like this, especially if you end up splashing this is the type of card you want, or if you have expensive late game effects, then you want this sort of mana rock. Now, where it gets really good is if you actually end up in the dragons, or if you end up in a devoted dragon deck, which isn't going to be a thing. It's even less so likely to end up in dragons than it is knights or zombies, because let's look at the facts here. There are six mythic rare dragons in the set. Six mythics, the five elder dragons, plus I think bone dragon, or whatever the mono black mythic rare is called. Six mythic rares, which, you know, a lot of times you won't get with dragon's horde. And then on top of that, there are two rare dragons, which, yeah, they're fantastic cards, but you're never getting past them. They're always going to get picked. Outside of that, you've got two uncommon dragons, one common in Sparkling Dragon, and then an additional uncommon, the gold um, poster card for Green Red, which is a creature that can sacrifice itself and turn into a dragon, essentially. So let's go ahead and cross out Demanding Dragon and Lathless, the Dragon Queen. That leaves you with four cards that can consistently tr trigger Dragon's Horde. But... The Dragon's Horde still taps for mana regardless of whether or not you get your dragons. Now, let's say you have a deck that has four dragons in it. I would definitely play Dragon's Hordes because anytime you draw one of those dragons, it essentially cantrips. It says draw a card attached to it. Plus, the Dragon's Horde lets you ramp out the more expensive ones early while also adding a little bit to your board. It doesn't do very much of anything if you're not drawing your dragons, but it still functions as a mana rock. If you took away that last ability the ability to tap for mana, I wouldn't like this card. But when you pick this card up, now you get to take cards like Dragon Egg and Spark Tongue Dragon a lot higher than you otherwise might have, and you get to power up your already busted rares in cards like Demand and Dragon or any of the Elder Dragons that you might have. So yeah, I see this as being a potential card that's great and sealed. You pick up an Elder Dragon, you have a Dragon's Horde, well, there you go. You have some sort of synergy going on there. But again, Dragon's Horde can affect how highly you take a card like Dragon Egg or Spark Tongue Dragon, and it really does hearken to that um, build-around presence, right? Now, again, it, it really draws its power off being a mana rock before everything else, but I think the combination of effects that it provides here make it a decent build-around, or at least something worth trying out. Um, at the very minimum, you always know it's going to give you that mana ramp and mana fixin', which already has a little bit of a premium on it in a limited format. All right, so we're out of tribal territory now. Let's go ahead and talk about another mythic rare, Resplendent Angel. This card seems nuts. So it's three and double white, three mana, for a mythic rare angel. It is a 3-3 three, three flyer. So your baseline is three mana, 3-3 three, three flyer, which is always a good card. I can't recall a format where that would be a bad card. And it has upside from there, just nothing but upside. So the main ability here is at the beginning of each end step, if you gain five or more life this turn, create a 4-4 white angel creature token with flying and vigilance. So anytime you gain five life at the end step of that turn, you get a Sarah Angel, which is insane. If you ever make one Sarah Angel off this card, how are you not winning this game? I, I have no idea. Not only are you gaining that five life, but their angel is alive and you get another 4-4. It's just win more, like extremely win more, right? And notice this happens on each end step, not just your end step, but if somehow you gain five life on your opponent's turn, boom, you get an angel at the end step, as long as the resplendent angel's still around, right? Now, the cool thing here is they made a little bit of a joke out of it, or a little bit of a gimmick. You can see what R&D did here with the activated ability. It has three triple white, so six mana, until end of turn, resplendent angel gets plus two, plus two, and gains a lifelink. So it becomes a five, five flying lifelink, which is insane already. Even if it didn't have the angel making ability, even if it didn't really have flying, this would already be an insane card. But the fact that you play your three mana, three, three flyer, you get some hits in, and then you pay six mana, and you just start having 10 point life swings, you're gaining five, your opponent's taking five, you're making four, four angels, you should win the game in the course of 
you know, two to three turns at most. And if your opponent can't answer the Resplendent Angel, it will win you the game. Now, the cool thing I noticed here is that R&D didn't just give you an easy way to make Resplendent Angel work. Let's say it gets smacked with Luminous Bonds. It can't attack or block anymore, but it's still on the board. You really want to trigger that ability and start getting angels out of it. Well, there are only two cards in this set. Palaka Worm and Dwarven Priest, of all things, that can gain you 5 life in one instance without combining cards together. Those are it. Palaka Worm and Dwarven Priest, those are the only cards in the set that can fulfill the 5 life in a turn on their own. But the thing about the Angel is, it doesn't have to gain 5 life off a single card, it just has to be a cumulative 5 life in the turn. You know, Invoke the Divine comes close at gaining you 4 life if you have an artifact or enchantment to destroy, but you need to gain that 1 extra life from somewhere else. And this is where I think the build-around aspect of Resplendent Angel comes in. There are tons of effects in this set that gain life or drain life from the opponent. The whole black-white theme for the set is draining life from the opponent and getting small incremental damage off of your life gain and turning that into some sort of win. You've got cards like your Vampire Sovereign and your Herald of Faith. These are just cards you're always going to play because they're great, but you've got to find ways to combine them together if you really want your Resplendent Angel to really tick, even if it gets slapped with an aura that makes it perhaps a little less useful, right? So you look at cards like Fountain of Renewal and Revitalize. These are cards that I expect to not be very good, or cards that'll go later in a pack, but when you have a Resplendent Angel, I might pick up a Revitalize earlier in the pack if I know that I can combine that with something else and get a 4-4 Angel out of the deal, right? So Resplendent Angel obviously has a lot of utility in the set. It's probably one of the best cards just off the top of my head, but I find it super interesting that it has a, a bit of a puzzle to go with it. Sure, it works on its own. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy of some sort where if you get to enough mana with enough time and you're not pressured too much you can just activate the ability and it fulfills itself but in worst case scenario you can piece together these other cards to still trigger the ability and i think that makes for a very interesting and unique build around albeit probably a card that's a little bit too strong and one that i'm not excited to play against at sealed events or in the general draft and that brings us back to one of the cards I've already mentioned, the Desecrated Tomb. So just as a quick reminder, this is a three-mana artifact. It is a rare, and it says whenever one or more creature cards leave your graveyard, weird text, create a 1-1 one, one black bat creature token with flying. So to the best of my ability, there's only maybe one or two cards that reference something happening when a thing leaves a graveyard. I know there's like a Rakshasa that gets bigger when cards are exiled from your graveyard, and there's... Erebos' Titan from Magic Origins. I don't even know what that card does. but So, essentially, the tomb makes a 1-1 flyer every time you pick a creature card out of your graveyard. It doesn't matter where it goes, whether it comes back to the battlefield or gets shuffled back into your library or back to your hand. It just makes you a 1-1 flyer anytime that happens. So, let's look at some of the ways we can make this happen. On screen, there are seven cards that I noticed that you can use to trigger Desecrated Tomb, and none of these are rares or mythics. They're all commons. The Trusty Pack Beast can pick up an artifact creature out of your graveyard and make a 1-1. Macabre Watts and Gravedigger and Rise from the Grave, these are all reanimation style effects, but even Macabre Watts shows that if a creature goes back to your hand from the graveyard, you get to trigger the Desecrated Tomb. Same with Recollect. Anytime you cast that and you return a creature from your graveyard to your hand, boom, 1-1 one, one Flying Bat. Reassembling Skeletons, one we already talked about, and obviously that's kind of the engine that works with Desecrated Tomb, especially if you have a Sacrifice Outlet, that's when things get a little bit crazy, but the card I noticed that was probably the most unique here is Abnormal Endurance. This is kind of a riff on a Supernatural Stamina from Amonkhet block. Um, it might have been Hour of Devastation, but I think it's Amonkhet. Essentially what happens is you use Abnormal Endurance on a creature before it dies, that creature will die and go to the graveyard, but then it will be returned to the battlefield tapped under its owner's control at the uh, oh, just immediately. As soon as it dies, it hits the graveyard, then it comes back, which does trigger Desecrated Tomb. A creature is leaving the graveyard, right? So if you look at these cards on screen, none of them are insane, right? Gravedigger's good. These are good cards. But when you attach the line, create a 1-1 flyer to them, they become pretty good cards. All of them would benefit immensely from having that line on them, especially the Reassem 1 Skeleton, which is the most repeatable way to do this. It is worth noting that Gravediggers work in conjunction with each other. If you have two copies of Gravedigger, you can kind of loop them together. Every time one dies, you cast the second Gravedigger to get the first one back. 
and that triggers desecrated tomb. So it's a way to continuously get a uh, flow of bats here, right? Now, desecrated tomb doesn't have too many things that work with it. There are a couple rares and mythics that can function with it, but, you know, a lot of times you're rare working with another rare. It's not a strategy you want to build around, so I don't imagine you're going to take Desecrated Tomb too often, but who knows? Maybe you have a Bone Dragon or Graveyard Marshal or Isreth the Awakener. These are cards that can repeatedly get out of the graveyard or return things from the graveyard and cause Desecrated Tomb to trigger. The two Planeswalkers here, Johnny and Liliana, can do it as well. And Remorseful Cleric um, can exile creatures from your own graveyard. Not 100% sure why you would sack a 2-1 flyer to get a 1-1 flyer, but hey, I wanted to cover all my bases here. So yeah, the Tomb is interesting. I think it's the type of card that you'll open, and normally you'll be disappointed, but who knows, there might be a deck around it, and there might be something I'm missing, too, that I'm just not seeing here. So let me know what you see that goes with the Desecrated Tomb, and keep in mind we're talking about Limited here. But yeah, try it out, and let me know if it works. And that brings us to the last one, which is the one that everybody wants to build their new Commander deck around. It's the one that everybody wants to open in Limited. That is the Elder Dragon, Arcades the Strategist. So... Arcades is one green, white, blue, four mana total in Bant colors for a 3-5 legendary Elder Dragon. It's a mythic rare like all of the Elder Dragons, and it has Flying and Vigilance. So stop there. Four mana, 3-5, Flying Vigilance. Fantastic card, right? Hard to kill, high butt. It has Evasion. It gets in there for three damage, and it blocks just as well as it attacks, which to me is already a great card. Now, the text here, which is much more than flavor text, says, whenever a creature with Defender enters the battlefield under your control, draw a card. So that's pretty good. It's a build around. You can start taking all of the Defender cards you see, and every time you have one enter the battlefield, boom, it cantrips. It draws a card. It's kind of like the Dragon's Horde, but instead of casting big, beefy dragons, you're casting Defenders that can't attack. Or, maybe they can. The second part of Arcade says, each creature you control with Defender assigns combat damage equal to its toughness, rather than its power, and can attack as though it didn't have defender. So boom, there's the build around there. There's what you want out of the card. Suddenly, all those defenders on board, they can attack, and not only do they have the ability to attack, but they can start dealing damage based on their toughness. So one thing to note here, there are actually not as many defenders as you might imagine in this set. There's a grand total of six. They're all commons and uncommon, so they're pretty accessible, and a lot of them are not cards that other decks are going to be interested in. I can see Dragon Egg and the two Artifact Defenders here being cards that a lot of decks might want. There's also Novice Knight, which is a knight, but isn't going to be great in a dedicated knight deck. But then you've got Wall of Vines and Wall of Mist, which are cards that most decks don't want at all. These are the type of cards you want with Arcades, the type of cards that you don't have to prioritize, the ones that you know are going to wheel out of a pack, and then the ones that you're going to be able to pick up late, prioritize removal early, and get rewarded for having this strategy that you're building around. Suspicious Bookcase. Um, first off, there is a Magic the Gathering card named Suspicious Bookcase. I don't know why, but it's here. We accept it. We move on with our lives. Anyway, I can't think of anything more satisfying than attacking your opponent with the Suspicious Bookcase. Now, I'm a huge fan of these sorts of cards, the ones that turn defenders into attackers, because they flip the game on its head. They make your Wall of Mist suddenly a 5-5 attacker out of nowhere, and you can do this as early as turn 5. Suddenly, your Wall of Vines are attacking. I think the key cards here are Wall of Mist and Suspicious Bookcase, because not only are they the highest toughness, but they're also super cheap. And keep in mind, Arcades draws you a card every time one of these enters the battlefield. Now, one warning about this, actually rather, two warnings. The first is that Arcades only works with defenders, not just high toughness creatures, but cards that specifically have the word defender printed on them. So your Surge Mare, your Zero Fives, your things like that that don't have defender, don't suddenly start dealing damage based on their toughness. It specifically specifies that the card has to be a defender, which is a little different than some of the other cards we've seen like Doran, and Weight Advantage and Assault Formation. Those don't care whether the card has Defender, it just cares whether the card has a big butt or not. The second thing to warn about is that if you're drafting Arcades, have a backup plan, because your Arcades will die some percentage of the time. Even though it's a little hard to kill and it gets down early and it can win a game fast, if your Arcades dies and suddenly your deck is just a bunch of Wall of Mists and Suspicious Bookcases, you're in a lot of trouble because you might not be able to win the game. So try coupling Arcades with a mill strategy or a flyer strategy and use those walls to stall things out. That's the great thing about cards like this are that walls are naturally 
just built to stall the game and make the game last for a longer time. So you have more time to find your bomb. You have more time to find Arcades and your other win conditions. So I can imagine that um, Blue Enchantment we talked about, the mill card, working in conjunction with Arcades and with wall decks and being a secondary built-in win condition in case something goes wrong with Arcades. So yeah, there's your defenders. I hope you have fun with your commander decks since everybody is going to be building this deck. And I hope you can get through the pre-release without dying to a suspicious bookcase at any point. Now, with all that being said, first things first, thank you all for watching. As always, anytime you spend your time watching my videos, I really appreciate it. It's like hanging out. I do want to say that, um, you know, we have a Twitter now, and I don't really know much about Twitter at all, but you can always like, comment, and subscribe here on Manor Rocks if you haven't already, or you can go to this thing called Twitter at MTG underscore Manor Rocks, and I don't know, tweet or whatever it is you do on there. I just figured it'd be nice to open up another line of communication for people in case they wanted to ask questions or see what I was thinking or do, I don't know, give suggestions about videos and stuff like that. But at any rate, remember, like, comment, and subscribe. Let me know what your favorite M19 build arounds are, or what your favorite cards from the set are, what you're looking forward to for limited. And I would love to hear from you guys. So again, thanks for watching. This is Timothy at Manor Rocks, and I'll see y'all next time.